Uh, before zooming into the demonstrators, I will start the webinar giving you a short overview of the Blue Cloud project. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the next one. Okay. So Blue Cloud is a three-year Horizon 2020 project started last October 2019 in response uh, to the call uh, Future of the Seas and Ocean Flagship Initiative. The total budget is around uh, 6 million euros and is led by a consortium of 20 partners with a mix of complementary skills spanning from the technological competencies in the infrastructure and data infrastructure area with partners like Maris, which is the technical coordinator of the project, uh, the National Research Council of Italy, Mercator Ocean, just to name a few of them. And uh, to domain specific experts, which are key players for the blue economy area, such as IFRIMER, CMCC, EMBL, VELITS, and FAO. Supported by two organizations uh, with expertise in communication and policy development, namely Trusted Services, which is also the coordinator of the project, and Seascape Belgium. Uh, the Blue Cloud partners also represent nine among uh, the leading marine data infrastructure in Europe. And I will tell you more about this later on. Next slide. So what is the vision? Uh, Blue Cloud aims to become the reference point for the Blue community in the need of data, analytics tool, and computing resources in the European Open Science Cloud landscape, but also in the future Blue Economy and Marine Research landscape. So as many of you will be surely familiar with the blue economy and marine research landscape, I would like to spend a couple of words on the European Open Science Cloud initiative. So EOSC is an initiative launched by the European Commission in the context of the digital single market in 2016. Uh, with the aim of building a virtual environment for scientists where they can access data and services across borders and disciplines to perform better science. There is a, an EOS governance at the moment, which is analyzing the landscape and shaping the future rules of participation and governance of EOSC. And on the slide, I've put the link to one of the latest documents released by the EOS governance, which is the EOS Work Plan 2020, where you will find all the activities and the main milestones foreseen by the end of the year. Blue Cloud wants to build the bridge between the EOSC community and the blue thematic communities to bring into EOSC the data and the services coming from the blue thematic community to make them discoverable, used, and in particular interoperable with all the other services that are currently part of EOSC. At the February All Atlantic Research Forum, the Commissioner Maria Gabriel highlighted Blue Cloud as one of the fundamental projects for the establishment of EOSC. Next slide. What do we want to do in practical terms? So Blue Cloud aims to pilot a cyber platform, bringing together and providing access to multidisciplinary data brought from observations and models analytical tools and computing and storage facilities, which will be essential to support researchers to better manage the aspects of ocean sustainability. Uh, the key word in the Blue Cloud project, as well as in all the EOS Carina, is federation. So we don't want to build uh, things from scratch, but we want to leverage on the existing infrastructures and the previous in investments. And on this slide, you can see all the blue data infrastructures part of the project. Imodnet, CDataNet, ICOS, uh, the Copernicus CMMS, Eurobis, Eurobime Imaging, EuroArgo, INA, Ecotaxa. And at the bottom of the slide, you can see the infrastructures that are supporting the federation and the provision of computing and storage resources. The Copernicus DIAS, D for Science Infrastructure, and the Europe in the UDAT Pan European Collaborative Data Infrastructure. The federation will be at the level of data, resources, and services. Uh, two in particular will be the main assets resulting from Blue Cloud a data discovery and access service 
to facilitate the sharing with the users of multidisciplinary data sets coming from the existing infrastructures part of the project, but with in mind the idea of onboarding new infrastructures in the future. And the blue, what we call a, a virtual research environment, VRE, uh, to facilitate the orchestration of the different computing and analytical resources that will be made available by the project. Uh, last but not least, uh, as Blue Cloud is piloting a model for thematic cloud in EOSC, Blue Cloud will be developing a community oriented roadmap for the future strategic development of Blue Cloud. Uh, this roadmap will be a policy document uh, describing the role of the thematic clouds uh, in the EOSC arena, but also analyzing how the blue thematic cloud can boost the blue economy by 2030. Uh, the roadmap will be co-designed with a large number of stakeholders through a series of public consultation uh, because we want really to build consensus about this future trajectory of Blue Cloud and also gather further inputs from other stakeholders also outside Europe. As mentioned at the beginning, uh, Blue Cloud will showcase its potential via five demonstrators in different scientific domains, uh, biodiversity, environment, fishery, and aquaculture. And you will hear more about this in the next presentations. So this uh, closes my introduction. And now I would like to pass the floor to the first speaker, who is um, Patricia Martin Cabrera, a member of the data centers center in the Flanders Marine Institute village that will give us an overview of the zoo and photoplankton EOV product demonstrator. Okay, thank you very much, Sara. Uh, so I will explain you the zoo and phytoplankton products that will showcase the potential of the blue cloud by combining plankton and environmental data, computing platforms and analytical services. So before I go in detail about the demonstrator, uh, why are we using plankton? Why is it so important? And what services can provide us that will ultimately help us to move towards a blue economy? Uh, so first, because it's the foundation and a vital component of most marine trophic webs, and it's key in most biogeochemical fluxes. So for instance, uh, uh, Plankton, uh, it, it contribute, contributes greatly to the ocean's ups, uptake and storage of carbon dioxide through the biological carbon pump. Uh, also, uh, it, uh, phytoplankton contributes to half of the global earth photosynthesis. And zooplankton being an intermediate species between primary producers like phytoplankton and larger consumers like fish. Uh, it will help us to understand the dynamics of food availability for commercially exploited fish species. Uh, in addition, there are also uh, good indicators of the health of the marine ecosystem um, uh, because they can respond uh, quickly to changes in the environment like nutrient pollution. Uh, they are also used uh, within several descriptors of the European Marine Strategy Framework Directive. Uh, in the picture, you can see highlighted the descriptors that respond are responding uh, plankton, and uh, also uh, phytoplankton abundance and diversity uh, are tagged as essential ocean variables by the uh, Global Ocean Observing System and the es as uh, essential climate variables under the Global Climate Observation System. Okay, so what is the aim of, of this demonstrator? Uh, we, we want to use a machine learning approach to derive phyto and zooplankton biomass and diversity products from the European seas, but also from the global ocean. So here in this chart, starting from the top left, uh, first we are compiling and, pro and processing uh, large scale plankton and environmental data from multidisciplinary marine networks. Uh, then uh, we apply big data analysis and machine learning methods uh, that will create innovative uh, products and that we will publish these results in, as a blue cloud service. 
uh, then these products will be integrated and validated uh, with uh, ground truth modeling using near real-time data. And uh, finally, these results will be implemented in the Blue Cloud uh, Virtual Lab uh, that will provide uh, users access to these data and methods and products. So, uh, how we will obtain these uh, phyto and zooplankton products? Uh, first, for data inputs, uh, we're using the, uh, data from Eurobis, Emotnet, CDataNet, Copernicus, and LifeWatch with uh, complementary uh, space time resolution data from satellites and Argo floats. Uh, so, this data will be used to develop a neural network model. And this, with this model, we will create first uh, 3D global phytoplankton products, like uh, the uh, graph, you can see the 3D graph, the cube on the top. And uh, this will be uh, actually two independent products. We will have total chlorophyll A, which is a proxy of phytoplankton biomass, and also um, a phytoplankton community product, which estimates phytoplankton diversity, uh, and then for zooplankton uh, products, we will show uh, a map uh, like the one you see uh, under the cube uh, that will show spatiotemporal uh, trends and long-term anomalies in the distribution of the most uh, dominant copepod species from the Northeast Atlantic. And then uh, finally, all this data will be uh, integrated in the model and used for validation. Uh, which uh, will uh, reveal uh, what are the contributors that explain the observed spatiotemporal changes. Um, and that's all for this uh, demonstrator. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, here you can see everyone involved in, in this work from FLIS and also from the Observatoire de Villefranche-sur-Mer uh, Lies and Liège University. If you want to know more, you can also visit our website to know more about our demonstrator. Thank you. Thank you very much, Patricia. And I remind the participants that if you have any questions for Patricia, just drop them in the, in the chat or in the Q&A panel. So now we move to the second speaker, who is Guy Cochrane the head of the European Nucleotid Archive, INA, at the European Bioinformatics Institute, EMBL, EBI, that will introduce the plankton genomics demonstrator. So thank you very much, Sara. So yes, this is the, the application of what the Blue Cloud offers us to uh, uh, the, the resolved genomics level uh, within the plankton. So uh, Patricia has already very ably introduced the plankton. Uh, suffice it to say, they are critically important, um, but surprisingly, uh, extremely uh, unexplored. So, so a great deal of diversity within the planktonic species is, is, is yet to be catalogued, let alone deeply investigated and understood. And so on the next slide, the Blue Cloud Genomics Demonstrator um, aims to address this, uh, address this exploration at the genomic level um, in the form of two notebooks. Uh, so here a notebook is a, a computational environment that comes with a set of uh, interfaces that uh, scientists can come into to discover, to integrate, to uh, analyze, and to explore and interpret um, uh, different data types of relevance. Uh, so that's both scientists from around the world, but it's also scientists who are building the, 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 the demonstrator uh, who will produce using the tools very specific data products. So in the first of the notebooks, this will be a set of occurrences. So georeferenced occurrences that relate to taxonomies and functions. So species and uh, genes and, and the pathways those genes um, uh, bring about. Uh, and then it will be a, a set of uh, correlations between those occurrences and um, environmental parameters that are measured uh, at the points of sampling. So the, so the point uh, environmental uh, characteristics. And then on the second notebook, the output consumes the first notebook and produces a set of global maps. It projects outwards to understand the global situation from a set of limited samples. Yeah, so the, um, the, the source data we use are, uh, is primarily, our exemplar is the Tara Oceans Project, which is a global uh, 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 set of voyages to explore the biological side of life. Um, it produces sequence data 
at high resolution, image data, so microscopic images, um, so the morphological data at high resolution, and then point uh, environmental measures. Uh, so actually, during the course of the project, we will see the emergence of many other relevant data types that we will also try to include from such project projects as Assemble Plus and Atlantico. And then for the broad environmental map, uh, we look to uh, the climatologist data from Siemens Copernicus. So, um, so this is looking in more detail at, at the first notebook. Uh, so on the left hand side, we have the, the, the data sources um, that come from the genomics data from CNRS Genoscope, imaging data from Sorbonne University and the Ecotaxa system, environmental data stored in Pangaea. Uh, so these data are already organized uh, to an extent into these systems. So here we see the interfaces that will be used to provide the data into the virtual research environment. These are provided by the infrastructures Elixir and Eurobioimaging. Here we see the, um, the details of the compute environment that we provided to people. I won't go into details. Uh, support for different languages and a whole host of tools are important for the, uh, for the exploratory and the preparation work. We see the outputs of that work. We see the taxonomies and the, the occurrences. Uh, and then uh, finally, these are delivered as data products uh, through different interfaces, in particular, uh, Zenodo OpenAir and within Elixir via studies and actually ENA. So there's a circular loop that goes back to the beginning. Some of the data types are relevant for that. We start to look at the second notebook. Uh, on the left, we have the two inputs. So the first is the input from the, uh, the from notebook one that I just described. Um, and then we're adding in environmental climatologists from Siemens Copernicus. We see the interfaces that are used. And then on the next slide, please. So this is the um, Sonoda Biostudies ENA um, and the Wakeo interface. And the following slide shows the environment. Uh, and then we have the that flashed up but a similar environment to the uh, to the to, to the previous to that in the previous notebook this produces allows us to produce the plankton biogeographies and then onto the next slide please these will be served up as outputs as an output uh, through uh, different interfaces uh, including emodnet in this case uh, open air zenodo and biostudies uh, as we see here and then onto the final slide please we just see the team uh, as it stands at the moment that is building the, the demonstrators from uh, Embel EBI, from Sorbonne University and from FLIS. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Guy. And start Sorry. again <laughs> with the third speaker. Uh, we, with Massimiliano Drudi, Senior Research Associate at the Euro Mediterranean Center on Climate Change, CMCC Foundation that will present uh, the Marine Environmental Indicators Demonstrator. Massimiliano, Thank the you, floor Sarah. is yours. Thank you, Sara. Uh, so, a few words about uh, the partners in this uh, demonstrator. Here, there are five partners with wide expertise uh, in environment monitoring, in blue economy, and in uh, scientific investigation related to the understanding of the <coughs> environment. And the partners are CMCC from Italy, IFREMER, France, Mercator Ocean International, France, KNMI, Netherlands, and the University of Bergen, Norway. The aims for this demonstrator are to support international stakeholders in the Marine Strategy Framework Directive and in the Blue Economy to generate new knowledge on the status of the ocean to develop innovative and flexible analytical capabilities, and to develop an innovative user interface, and to foster a long-term sustainable blue economy roadmap. From the user perspective, the design is based on needs and requirements of the environmental agencies. This service will bring together into the same framework data, computational resources, scientific expertise, and innovative technology in order to implement uh, several operations on the multi-source input data sets, such as installation of a portion of data, performing analytics, or display the available indicators. Next slide, please. Each user will be able to generate and share results through the common catalog, 
several kinds of methodology will be made available for the processing and it will be possible to display indicators including among others climatological fields, time series or trends in a selected area and period of time. The implementation plan consists in two main phases. First, the integration phase this year, aiming to integrate the state of the art into the blue cloud infrastructure. Then the development, development phase will take place next year, in which the blue cloud infrastructure will boost further the development of, of new capabilities. In this demonstrator, data will come from five external data sources, which are five European blue data infrastructure, which are Copernicus Marine Service and Climate Service, Hemodnet, Eurargo, Argo GDAC, Ecos Marine, CDataNet. And all of those will be federated with a common discovery and that service within the Blue Cloud project. And we will exploit it. One important part of the implementation plan is the capability development. The, the target for the second year are to develop and implement the new analytics, exploiting the machine learning and the uncertainty analysis, to extend the type of input variables so we can process we will start from physical variables, then in the second year also atmospheric and biogeochemical variables. To increase the temporal resolution of the input fields, at the beginning it will be uh, monthly fields, then later we want to exploit the resolution available of the daily fields. And to extend the geographical area up to cover the global ocean. And then this is it for this demonstrator. Okay, thank you, Massimiliano. And now I think we can move to the last uh, speaker. So, last but not least, we have Anton Ellenbrock, who works in the fisheries department of the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations to assist the development of affordable data services in support to the sustainable management of marine limit resources that will present the two use cases on fisheries and aquaculture. Anton, the floor is yours. Yes, uh, good morning, everybody, or good afternoon. With these Zoom meetings, you never really know where people are listening from. Uh, thanks for joining this uh, seminar. It's um, in FEO. Um, we have already now to summarize an activity of five years with more than, uh, I think, maybe 50 people in five minutes. So bear with me if it is all a bit quick and if I take uh, very big steps. But for the fisheries uh, demonstrator, I want to demonstrate some work that was done in FEO, so especially Emmanuel Blondel and Aureliano Gentile are very active now in the project. In fourth, in Greece, we have a good collaboration on the global records of stocks and fisheries with Janus uh, Marketakis in particular. And with IOD in France, uh, we work a lot on fisheries data, especially tuna data with uh, Julien Bart in France. Uh, the demonstrator is not something completely new. It starts with already existing FAO systems. For instance, you see here two examples of FAO systems that already use uh, geospatial layers to help people understand better the dynamics of fisheries, so where they are taking place and how they are managed. And in the bottom left, for instance, you see an example of uh, a sea mount. So this is based on a collaborative map. So it's not only FAO that makes these maps. We make all these products in collaborations with other organizations. That is why we also think it's important to have an infrastructure like D for Science, where we can invite people to work with us to help us make these uh, products better and make them more informative for other users. The maps are also not only for FAO, we really try to bring them to a global audience. So we really have this vision where Blue Cloud can help us getting the data better organized and better disseminated not only through FEO, but also through other organizations. And so the fisheries atlas that we are developing now, of course, is not a product, but it's more a flexible solution. And since a lot of data are geospatial, 
we've really gone down the ISO OGC uh, path for standards and management of uh, spatial data. So here we want to focus on defining and accessing spatial data related to fisheries. So we want to give you access to data from fisheries organizations, a collaboration in the Tuna Atlas viewer, and all the information we collect is stored in an ISO OGC map backend based on the geo server. So having the data there uh, helps us then to give people access to interoperate and collaborate with these products through d science And now we are working to implement metadata driven feature editing. So this gives a lot of power to the users. It's not only a central organization that decides what's going to be published, but we really want to invite others to help us improve the data that we collect and also the data <coughs> that we uh, represent. So the analysis part. And then uh, to have this analysis integrated in a system, we also work with metadata-driven uh, design of data flows. So we, the, the viewers are quite flexible. They are all pushed out of an ODC infrastructure. So we, you can really define what the information will look like in the end, but you can also uh, work on the um, analysis of the data using the same metadata-driven approach. It's all a bit short, but it is uh, really operating like this. And then we want to make our stuff uh, reusable and publishable and exposable. So we have a, a huge effort in standardization and harmonization of data, which makes it more easy to have it published in a map. So through the embedded geo network, we can publish maps, but you, we can also make our data findable and accessible. And we can also access uh, the data through services. For instance, we use the Diva Science GCAT services on top of a Seek and registry. Uh, to develop registries where you can quickly find data by issuing a simple search instead of going through a complicated uh, search uh, protocol. So this is just a quick visualization of uh, how we approach the organization and the publication of the data. So you see it starts on the left more with the technologies, the geo server and uh, catalog services and then in a few steps, you arrive at the far right where the data are exported and shared. So this is maybe more a reference than an explanation that I give, but you can later go through the slides and see actually what they might mean. So uh, what do we then do with all this data? So we, uh, once we have organized it, one idea that we have and we have already implemented is also to make it accessible for others and uh, to, for instance, in traceability studies or to make assessments of the SDGs, the progress towards the sustainable development goals, in particular 1441. And for that, we have uh, set up this uh, registry called the Global Record of Stocks and Fisheries, which is an integrated blue cloud registry where we issue unique identifiers on collated information. That means that you have, for instance, in the illustration here, you see there's a lot of different anchovy fisheries in the Mediterranean. And we assign these with unique identifiers and we make them traceable and visible. So a complete transparent system on fisheries in here, the Mediterranean, but we want to have a global coverage. And that we use uh, that to assess, uh, to give information on the stock status, which is interesting if you are in traceability. For instance, you can inform your audience how sustainable the fisheries are the, of the fish that you sell. So the global registry is uh, collected from three global resources and we harvest them on demand. So we have a set up a system where we can go into their systems and harvest their data. And then we semantically integrate those into a knowledge base developed by fourth in the Greece. Then we have a collaboration phase where all the data are harmonized in the knowledge base that is uh, done uh, in FEO with a few collaborators in the uh, source uh, organization. So we all agree on what we publish. It is transparent and visible for everybody. And then we connect all the information we collect to geolocations, which makes them also easy to visualize on the map. And then they are just published again for traceability and SCG 14, either in a browsable map viewer or in a seek and registry with the, again, the GCAT service. So you see again here a reuse of services that were used for fisheries atlases are also used in the global records of stocks and fisheries, which means that we have some economy of scale with reusing the for science uh, infrastructure support. And this is then a bit what it looks like in the end. So a browsable, simple uh, seek and registry and a flexible, um, more geo network oriented uh, web viewer. Also here, a quite a complex workflow that I already mentioned a bit. So this is just a bit to illustrate the workflow, how we fetch the data, how we uh, normalize, clean them, then publish them, and then you can exploit them in the end. 
so that was the more uh, fisheries oriented part. So now we have a similar parallel activity on the aquaculture monitor, where again, Emmanuel Blondel provides all uh, geospatial data services. And we work there with, uh, for instance, Emeric Lavergne from CLS in France to develop a service that really tries to monitor aquaculture. And how we are going to do that, I will show you now in a few slides. So it is an already existing uh, example that was developed in the Defo Science infrastructure already. And it is uh, used now for location detection. So we have it already operational. We can identify farms and their attributes in Greece. So you can um, use a geospatial data to detect the farms. And then we have, as you see in the bottom left, a sort of an editing uh, screen where users can edit what they see actually on, the, on that farm location. On the right, we see a different product that is also going to be further developed in Blue Cloud next year. And that looks more at the distinction between paddy fields and rice fields. And there we use a combination of Sentinel-2 and Sentinel-1 imagery. So what does this uh, AAPS thing in Greece, what can it already do? So we have developed a global map with detected and validated locations. And we use the same uh, backend that we use for the fisheries uh, data. So you see again, reuse and reusability of services in the infrastructure. And then you can zoom into a region. So you see that the, when you zoom in, you can discover the numbers and location of individual farms. And we have done this for maps over Greece and Malta. When you further zoom in, you get to the individual farms and then you can see an image of the cage cluster. Then you can edit the cage cluster features. So you can say if what type of fish they are breeding, what the name of the owner is, what type of uh, cages are used. So you build up a very broad statistics in your country. And then you have a phase where you can validate your changes. So if you make a mistake, you can always take a step back. So this is really uh, a connection between users and geospatial data managers. So this is the, the editing phase. So you see here the, uh, what was automatically detected in red. Those are the cages and the cage structures. And then the editing phase is on the central panel. You can edit all those features and then you can say, okay, I'm done with editing and then you publish it and then the site turns green. So you have a fully user controlled workflow from a geospatial data to a uh, user map. So now we want to take the next step in uh, Blue Cloud. So we know where the farms are, but how do we monitor them? So what happens over the course of a year? So we want to start with a time series of images over a farm area. And then we want to see if we can automatically with uh, some artificial intelligence and deep learning if there was any activity over the season. And so we can make a prediction of the total area under production. And that gives us also an estimate of the total aquaculture production in an area. So here we also want to overlay with other blue cloud maps to improve our estimate of activity and also to have it more uh, useful for spatial planning. So for instance, we want to get uh, data on, the, on pollution, maybe on some uh, 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 deoxygenating events or with uh, harmful algae bloom events. And we want to see if we see that in a dynamic with the aquaculture production so we can make a better prediction of aquaculture production based on data that come from the other demonstrators. And then next year we want to work again in the coastal pond area. And then you can go to the next slide, that's no problem. So we do not only focus on cages, we also are not forgetting the land-based aquaculture, but we will start doing that next year. So how are we going to do this? So we need these high resolution images over a farm and then we take a time series of this. And then again, how do we use uh, artificial intelligence and deep learning to monitor the activity? We are going to look at these cage area in very high detail and make inferences on what type of activities are taking place based on the automated analysis of the images. So these were very quickly the two demonstrators that FAO is coordinating. We are not leading them, but we are really coordinating it. This is really a collaborative effort also with the other demonstrators and the Defo Science infrastructure team. So for the fisheries atlas and the global record, we want to include more stocks and fisheries. So if you have access to resources on these, you are welcome to contact us and we will try to help you share the information if it's relevant information. We also want to improve our connection to what we do in this infrastructure with people that work more downstreams on the market. So the, especially the traceability of fish is of interest to us. And we want to connect fisheries to environmental services to have a better understanding of the spatial dynamics of fisheries and you know, make more useful uh, marine spatial planning um, information products. For the cage detection and validation of the workflow, we have uh, currently limits in the coverage of area. So if you have uh, access to good uh, spatial 
uh, optical VHR data, we uh, welcome collaboration uh, proposals. And we also have now a limitation in ground proofing, so we know what we see from space, what we don't know if what we see from space is what's really happening on the on the field. And also probably we will reach out a bit to see if we get more, can get some farm inventory specialists to validate the products that we will be uh, developing, that will be next year. And we also want to fully automate the cage detection used with deep learning uh, technologies on Sentinel data. That's probably will start in the blue cloud, but maybe also later in the project, we might want to reach out to see what other people are doing in this area and see how we can compare and maybe even collaborate what we are doing in Blue Cloud and outside of Blue Cloud. So those were the two last demonstrators. So thank you for any questions and comments and suggestions for improvements. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Anton. So I will stop sharing my screen and let me go back to the uh, questions. So, so now it's time for questions from the audience. So I don't see any questions uh, in uh, in the chat. Uh, not even in the Q&A panel. Uh, I've spotted before there was uh, an end raised. I think it was uh, Sabine. I don't know if uh, uh, Anyone from the participants uh, would like to to ask a question to our panelists? Yes, we have a question from Sabina. So I will give you the speaking rights. So Sabina, you should now be able to talk. Yes, hi, I'm hi. Sabina from Nigeria. Hi, Hi. Can, you, can you, yeah, we can hear you. Can you please introduce yourself first? Okay, I'm Sabina from Nigeria. Yes. Do you okay. have a question from, uh, for our panelists? Yes, I have a question. I want to really know the marine indicators because I didn't get that clearly. Uh, they were not specific like to outline the specific marine indicators. So I want to get those. Massimiliano, I think this question is for you. Yes, yeah, the second speaker. This yeah. is Can you please clarify what type of marine indicators uh, you are tackling in your demonstrator? Uh, yeah, th there are many. So this is the reason actually we didn't write in a slide uh, a list, uh, an attempt uh, of a list of the marine indicators. Uh, for in the first year, we are starting uh, with uh, um, monthly, for, exa for example, monthly climatological fields uh, of temperature, salinity, uh, kinetic energy, um, um, currents, uh, uh, those are, those are the first we are starting to deal with during this first year. And there will be climatological fields, uh, mean time series in uh, the Mediterranean Sea. Um, then, then in the second year, there will be more, more indicators uh, for instance, uh, upwelling indicator, mixing indicators, and uh, where well, maybe I, I don't have a list now with me, but uh, if possible, we can provide an exact list of everything we are going to produce during the first year and in the second year. I don't know if uh, this can help to, to give an exhaustive answer to, uh, to Sabrina. Okay. Is it okay? Okay. In any case, I'm going to to post in uh, in the chat the um, uh, email address uh, uh, that you can use to reach out to the project. So, in case you have any other questions or you want extra clarification, so you can use this email address, and we'll get back to you. Uh, so, thanks, uh, uh, Sab Sabina, for. Uh, for your question. Uh, I see we have a question in the chat. Uh, sorry, in the Q&A first. Uh, 
from Duranta. Uh, are the data and information on Blue Cloud will be free access? Uh, does it cover all around the world? So maybe I can comment here. Uh, so about the, um, how the data will be made available, of course, uh, it depends on the data provider. So each data provider has its own policies. So some of them are open access, some others are free access, some others no. So it really depends on the, on the policies uh, of the data provider. And about the geographical coverage, so as you see, we have uh, players that also have data from uh, not exclusively uh, European data. Uh, so for sure, we would like to expand beyond Europe. But, but I mean, the primary um, scope in the beginning will be for Europe, especially for some demonstrators, for some others, other data will be included. Any of the panelists wants to add any other comment on this points about the data guy please go ahead yeah so so from the uh molecular data um we have a a, a a a very open data culture and the core the data repositories and the infrastructure that's serving that the elixir infrastructure that's serving those repositories um are open and free at the point of the data are free at point of use um so there's no restrictive licensing there uh, for the images, for many of the projects, these are also open, um, but uh, we haven't seen them all yet, so we're not, we can't be certain that all the images will be, will be uh, delivered on, on fully permissive licenses. Um, I understand that the products we will use and the, 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 the products we will use from CMEMS, Copernicus are also open. Um, so I suspect that, that many of the integrated output products we produce will be um, uh, redistributable freely. Um, and certainly we are we're striving to enable that. Uh, the, the open nature of the, um, of, of the service that with the integrated products that we're trying to provide through the demonstrator in the notebooks um, uh, is, is, is really essential to get the maximum use out of it. Yeah, thanks. Uh, Patricia, go. <laughs> yeah, I would like also to add same like guy that the data we're using for our demonstrator is uh, all open access as well and it's freely available. <laughs> Excellent, thanks. Um, there is another question in the Q&A panel, uh, always related to the marine, uh, to the environmental indicators, Massimiliano. And the question is uh, uh, if the indicators are in line with the ones being developed uh, in the frame of the marine strategy framework directive exercises. <clears throat> yes, it is. Um, at the beginning, before Blue Cloud, uh, it was the starting point, of course. So we are absolutely taking into consideration what was uh, uh, advised from the Marine Strategy and Framework Directive for the uh, assessment of the ecosystem and to reach the good environmental status. Okay, thanks. And then there was a comment uh, in the chat, I think always related to the, uh, to the indicators, I guess, uh, asking about the freshwater environment. No, maybe not. Uh, I don't know if this is related to one of the Anton uh, demonstrator, but uh, I, I would like to ask uh, to the person that posted this question, maybe to clarify better the question. So please uh, um, rephrase it. I think, Sarah, the question is uh, quite clear, but the, oh, I think okay. in Blue Cloud we are really focusing on the marine environment. So this is not so much for uh, inland waters and lakes and mangroves. In the aquaculture case, we will have a use case on uh, like brackish water aquaculture, but we are trying to not go too deep in the in freshwater environments in Blue Cloud. Okay, thanks, Anton. So I, I hope that we answer uh, the questions. Um, I don't see any other uh, questions in the chat, but as we have still uh, like 10 minutes, uh, maybe I would like to do a sort of uh, a room table with the, with the panelists and maybe ask uh, 
some of the most frequent questions uh, that we that we usually get uh, uh, when we talk about the demonstrators mm -hmm. that they can stimulate some other uh, questions so maybe i will start from patricia and actually the question that i would like to ask you is uh, what is the major it innovation from your demo so if you can explain this to the audience uh, that would be great uh, the major sorry can you repeat it innovation ah, from your demo uh, well i would say the neural network uh, method we are using uh, it has been already developed and tested but at a very, at a very uh, small scale so one uh, one big uh, innovation will be to use this neural network method in a global scale uh, with a new data set or at least updated uh, data set that are available from the marine infrastructures. Uh, so all uh, the results of this will be in the blue cloud um, environment, research environment. So it would, it's going to be very uh, novel, will be like all these products and data and workflows will be available to download. Uh, to access them without downloading, without needing a, a high computational power. So basically you would be even able to, to look at these products from a smartphone. So, yeah. Okay, thanks. Um, if I go instead to the plankton demonstrator to, to you guys, so we always, I mean, we are always hearing about the importance of uh, multidisciplinary, multidisciplinary data and the benefits that these data uh, from different disciplines can bring. So you are combining in your demonstrator bio, biomolecular microscopy image and environmental data types. So what will be the most important benefit of this combination of this data, in your opinion? Well, I think that, so, so life is very complex and, and the different methods you use to measure it um, are, they only give you partial results. And so if you look at the genes, if you use sequencing to look at the genes within a, a set of organisms in a, somewhere in the sea, um, then you get a certain amount of signal. If you use another method, uh, such as microscopy, then you get morphology, a certain amount of morphological information. Um, and you're expecting to see uh, in, in these samples the same, uh, some of the same organisms. Um, and so you can look at the intersect. So you have, by combining two different dimensions of study, you can reveal more of the patterns than you can with anyone alone. So I think that's the, that's the biggest appeal. And then of course, all of this lies within the context of, 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 of the environment in which the organisms live. Uh, correlating with that, um, then allows you to begin even to look at the, um, the, the biochemistry, the, the interaction with the environment. Okay, thanks. Um, if we go back to Massimiliano, so Massimiliano, you already got quite a lot of questions about the marine indicators, but uh, linking back to the question that we got about the geographical coverage. So your demonstrator is starting with the data from the, the Mediterranean Sea. So do you have any plan of expanding uh, the data that you're using? Yeah, yeah, of course. Uh, yes, actually, uh, some activities are already working outside of the Mediterranean Sea. So uh, we, are, we are taking into consideration other areas since the beginning. And uh, the plan is to have a service that is able to cover the, uh, the North Sea and the Global Ocean during the, at the end of the second year. So this is our target. Okay, thanks. And then we still have a couple of minutes. Um, Anton, about the, the fisheries demonstrator. So I would like to go back and talk about the, the different data that you are using. So now the fisheries atlas uh, is showing fisheries data, but what about the related data from CMMS or ocean biodiversity? What's the plan there? So we would like to see a bit the spatial dynamics of fisheries. So if we see a fleet fishing over a specific area of the ocean, can we try to see a correlation between, for instance, ocean fronts or phytoplankton? But also a bit more historic. So if there was a phytoplankton uh, growth somewhere, do we see an impact on fisheries maybe half a year later? 
So all those sorts of questions are only able if you collect all your data in an infrastructure where you can easily access them, where they have a similar type of uh, spatial definition. And if they are stored close together, also the processing is a bit faster than when you have to collect all your information everywhere. <clears throat> so one of the advantages we see in Blue Cloud is bringing these data together. And what then the specific research questions will be, that is for all the creative people that are now attending uh, to the site. But just by bringing them together, we, we can do this and it is very difficult now. Okay. And uh, then just to close uh, um, the webinar, so one question about the aquaculture uh, demonstrator. Uh, and I also want to get back to the different type of data that we're using because in Blue Cloud, we are also trying to combine in situ and remote sensing data. Mm -hmm. So how important would be remote sensing data for the aquaculture monitoring for national governments? Well, I prefer to go to every farm by boat if it's nice weather, but <laughs> some of these... <laughs> But, but what are the just, challenges? But, because but not, in, not in Norway. So in Norway, it is always <laughs> uh, terrible weather. So there, I think it's uh, for a situation where farms are remote or where, they, where your spatial planning is not so solid, we would prefer to have this done with a um, Copernicus analysis to find the farms and then to do monitoring with high-resolution optical imagery. I think it is you are way ahead of any other uh, type of monitoring if you would be able to do that. If you are then managed to link to harmful algae blooms or other environmental events that will, may have an impact or the occurrence of a disease in an area and you understand the ocean currents, you can make predictions or you can make interventions before the disease arrives. So you really get a much better, not only monitoring to control people, but really to help people improve the management of their farms. You can alert them like a few weeks in advance that there is a potential risk coming their way that can be a harmful algae bloom or can be a disease. So this really puts the aquaculture sector, I think, in a much more stable and, and economically um, viable environment. So also for investors, it becomes then much more uh, trustworthy to invest their money in aquaculture and help countries to develop an aquaculture sector where there currently is um, maybe a small one, but it needs some investments to start developing. And with this tools like this, you really give trust to investors to um, put some money in aquaculture and build up an economic sector in the country. Yeah, and Anton, there is a question for you in the Q&A panel, uh, asking if you also included data, for example, spawning ground on the blue cloud and what indicators of stock status uh, you can inform about? Uh, spawning rounds are not in, no, but it, is, it should not be technically a problem, but it is just not what we do. So we work in the statistics branch, so the data that we collect are data that are reported by countries as their catch or by individual organizations that want to bring the catch. So this is not only an FAO product, it is a wide collaboration, so I'm not speaking for FAO now but more about the, what the project can do. So the project can manage any geospatial data. So we could manage spawning grounds and other information, but this is not an FAO activity. We are more into the traceability. So we, uh, give a, we receive uh, an assessment of a country or an organization about the status of their stock. This is the country's opinion. We trust that they have done a good scientific uh, exercise to make this assessment. And then we just publish it and then for traceability purposes, I think what is currently lacking in a lot of uh, traceability schemes is to give people a assessment of the status of the stock of where the fish came from. So I think there we can make an important contribution at a global level. So not only for uh, rich and very well uh, managed fisheries, but also we try to reach out to situations where it's more difficult to get a good assessment of the stock. And we try to help people there in often in developing countries to also may help them make an assessment and, and tell the planet how well they are managing their stocks if they do. Thanks, Anton. And as time is over, I just want to take the last question from the, the Q&A about uh, Joao uh, is asking about ocean pollution, plastics and climate change. What are the approaches that we are adopting in the project? Maybe I don't know if Patricia, you want yeah. to? Yeah, well, um, 
just uh, to put them all <clears throat> together as anthropogenic uh, impacts. Uh, as I explained also when I was talking about the importance of plankton, uh, they are used, they're used as uh, indicators for the health of the marine ecosystem, especially for nutrient pollution uh, and climate change. And we are also, when I was mentioning that we are using environmental data, so we are using uh, some parameters like temperature, oxygen. So all this, with all this information and with the anomalies we will find in our products, we can infer uh, and tackle uh, these anthropogenic stressors and see what, what are the contributors. Okay, thank you very much. So Sarah, uh, one last comment. I see yes. a question about uh, Omega-3. So we also work in Blue Cloud to establish connections to the food cloud. So this is a question that goes more to the direction of the food cloud, but we are working to have in the global record of stocks and fisheries also information on the composition of the fish but you have to wait for that. But in terms of your question, like human beings, you are what you eat. That goes also for fish. So depending on what the fish has been eating over its lifespan before it ended on your plate, depends on how much omega-3 you can find in that fish. So. Thanks, Anton. So no, I would like to- It's not a yes, no uh, question. So there's no yes, no answer. So I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. So. I would like to thank once again all our panelists. So thank you very much uh, for your presentations, for your answers. Uh, I would like also to thank all the participants for the patience uh, with our technical glitches. <laughs> uh, and thanks a lot for your questions. Uh, as I said, the recording will be published on um, the Blue Cloud website together with the presentation. And you can reach out to us at any time uh, you would like. Uh, we are going to organize uh, uh, some other webinars uh, after summer and actually what we are planning to do is to have uh, webinars dedicated to each of the demonstrators so we can really zoom in on a specific topic uh, and discuss uh, the workflows of the demonstrators, the challenges that they are addressing and all the other uh, matters. Uh, so thank you very much. Uh, I wish you a lovely weekend. Bye-bye.